Welcome back to the main auditorium. Change the street, change the world. That is so bold. How on earth are you going to do that? I am going to leave that in the hands of your keynote speaker for this afternoon, Jeanette Sadiq Khan. Good afternoon, Jeanette. Thank you. Thank you, Femi. Buenas tardes. Um, it is great to be with all of you here today. And I'm going to start with a question. What's the greatest city in the world? Outside of Barcelona and your city, what's the best city in the world? What comes to mind? I'm asking you a question. New York. Seoul. Seoul. Copenhagen. Copenhagen. Padova? There's that. <laughs> so when you ask this question outside of this audience, um, a lot of the same cities come to mind. London and Paris and Rome. And it's interesting, why do so many people agree on what the greatest cities are? What do they have in common? It's not their buildings, it's not their monuments, it's not their skylines. Cities are great because of what happens at street level. And great cities have great spaces and great places. As you can see here, and you can see in any city, even in my hometown of New York, life is not lived at the penthouse level. Life is lived on the street. And the reality is that life on our streets doesn't always add up to our love for our cities. And if you've ever been to Paris, you can see the disconnect between the ideal that people love and the reality on the street that people loathe. Between how we revere our history and the little regard our cities sometimes have for those who live there today. And while the monuments bless residents and visitors in Rio, those blessings don't often extend to the street. And in a lot of places, if you're not in a car, you're on your own. And it's not that we don't know how to make great streets. It's that we've spent most of the last century doing something else. We've built our streets around the new technology at the time, the new mobility technology, automobiles. Our streets used to be shared spaces where people walked and biked, and there were carriages and streetcars. This is Mulberry Street in Lower Manhattan 100 years ago today. And here is the same street now. The street was taken over by cars, by traffic signals and signs. Seen through a windshield, a good street is a street that's clear of obstacles. This is the perspective that our streets have been designed from. And in building dream streets for cars, we've stopped seeing them as places for people and started seeing them just as a way to get somewhere else. And drivers learn to stop for red lights instead of stopping for people. They own the road. And pedestrians and bikers and people on bus became obstacles. And a lot of cities in the United States and around the world are the result of that dashboard view of the road, which I call mansplaining. And after a century of building roads and installing traffic signs and signals, our streets should be safe, right? And they should be traffic free. And instead, we have streets that are inefficient and deadly. 1.35 million people die on our streets around the world every single year. 154 people die an hour on our streets. And instead of stepping up, we've simply lowered our expectations and just sort of learned to live with this danger. Traffic fatalities are the number one killer of people 
from 5 to 29 years old. But instead of fixing the street, we teach our kids to fear it and to avoid it. And a lot of cities have just given up. And they ask pedestrians to wave these high visibility yellow flags. And this isn't a solution. This is a sign of surrender. We didn't solve our traffic problems as much as we've accommodated them, thinking that more roads will save us. But as a well-known urbanist, Lewis Mumford, said over 50 years ago, building more roads to solve congestion is like loosening your belt to solve obesity. It's simply doesn't work. But if you think about it, if you applied that approach to another field, say, computer technology, you know, there was a time when computers took up entire floors of office buildings. But computer engineers didn't build mainframes that were bigger and slower. No, they started making processors smaller, yet faster and more powerful and less expensive. Now, why haven't we thought about that and that approach on our streets? Our streets don't update themselves. But I always think it would be great if they could. Whenever I go to a city, I think it would be so great if I could just have like a remote control and push a button and boom, I could have you know, safer streets and I could have streets that I could just add benches or we could push a button and we could have bike lanes or push a button and we could have bus lanes. Everything would just update. You know, push a button like we did here on First Avenue and voila, we have bike lanes and pedestrian islands and bus lanes and traffic calming. So there may not be an app for that yet, but today, for the first time since we lost our cities to cars, there is an urban revolution about redesigning and reimagining our streets, reimagining them for a new age. In New York City, Mayor Bloomberg's long reign sustainability plan was the closest thing that we had to an update button. It identified the changes that we needed to do to accommodate the million more people that were expected to move to New York City by 2030 and still improve the quality of life in our business districts and neighborhoods and reduce our greenhouse gases by 30%. It had policies and programs on everything from energy and land use to transportation and housing. And it was about getting our infrastructure into a state of good repair, but also about redesigning the hardware on our streets and to give people more choices for getting around. Because changing the hardware on our streets is almost always the most difficult part of changing our cities. And when I became transportation commissioner in 2007, there were basically no goals set for increasing the number of people walking or biking or taking the bus. There were no goals for reducing traffic fatalities or injuries. There wasn't even a strategic plan to outline how we could get from here to there. And the status quo said it was impossible to change New York City because New York was New York. We were too New York to bike. Our buses were a joke. But we took streets like these and we changed them so that they worked better for everyone. And it didn't take years of planning studies and millions of dollars. We showed results quickly to show what was possible on the streets of the city, transforming, transforming streets all across town, seeing the possibilities that were hidden between the lanes. And by following the people and their footsteps, you can see what's needed. You can see the outline of the city that you need to build. A wide open street that was a runway for speeding cars, became a leafy residential street where, with bike lanes and a pedestrian walkway. You can see where people are at risk. 
and where they need refuge. And this wasn't just a series of one-off projects. It was actually a new approach to urban design. One of our big priorities was redoing our bus network. I look at streets and I see them as a surface rail for our buses. And we had a lot of opportunity because New York City has the largest bus fleet in North America and we have the slowest bus speeds. In fact, the only competition that we had in New York that turned out wrong, I thought, was every year we have a competition between a bus and a person on a bike, on a trike, not even a bike. And guess who wins every year? The trike. My chief engineer used to say the only way to get across town was to be born there, which is not a great strategy for a world-class city. And so we moved fast, taking congested corridors like this one in the Bronx, and turned it into a rapid bus line with dedicated lanes, making it possible for people to pay before they got on the bus, giving them a dedicated lane, and with cameras that we put on these corridors to keep and t ticket cars that got in their way. There are now 20 routes um, all across the city that are making, uh, that have made these uh, routes 27% faster than they were before without building a single tunnel, without building a light rain, rail, without billions of dollars. We've made the commuting patterns for 600,000 passengers better each day. Now, Changing direction is just not a matter of turning your back on cars. You have to turn to something better. And we worked very hard to make biking into a real transportation option for New Yorkers. People used to say that you were crazy to bike in New York City, that the only people that did that were delivery people or people that didn't actually have another choice. So in 2009, we took Ninth Avenue uh, 2007, we took 9th Avenue, which used to look like a highway, and we built the first parking protected lane in the United States. And we adopted an idea from Copenhagen, and I know that Copenhagen's in the house, so thank you, Copenhagen. And we put the bike lane against the curb, and we used the parked cars to protect the cyclists. We put in pedestrian refuge islands, and we gave local businesses uh, more space for deliveries. And bike lanes aren't just good for bike riders. They're the anchors for an entirely new kind of street. And we built 400 miles of bike lanes, 644 kilometers in six years. This is the map in 2007, and this is the map in 2013. And I love this, because this is as closest I'll ever get to an update button. You just push it, boom, voila, bike lanes. No problem there, everybody loved them right off the bat. So this led to a tripling of bike ridership in the last decade and to the fact that New York City became the safest it's ever been uh, in history. And these protected designs became standard all around the United States and they've become standard all around the world. And safe infrastructure is really the bedrock of a successful biking culture. And our bike lane investments supported the launch of City Bike which is the largest bike share system in North America. And City Bike has been a huge success. It's racked up 90 million rides uh, in six years and is growing to 40,000 bikes. All of this in a city where just a few years ago people thought you were crazy uh, to bike and they didn't even know what bike share meant. And today, a typical rider looks like the woman on the right instead of the Mad Max messenger on the left. Probably the biggest showcase of this change-based approach is in Midtown Manhattan. How many of you have been to New York City in the last 10 years? Huh, wow. How about the last five years? Okay, last year? Okay, our tourism program is clearly working. So you've all seen so many of these changes, right? Okay, so this is a picture of Midtown Manhattan. Does anybody know where this is? Anybody who knows who this is gets a prize. Who, where is this? Times Square. You will get a prize at the end of this talk. Thank you. 
So this is Times Square in the 1930s, and you can see it's, it's full of people and buses. Um, it's got a few cars. And this is the same spot in 2008, overrun by cars, and people have just 10% of the space, even though they are 90% of the traffic. And the crash rates and congestion rates on, in this corridor were much higher than on parallel streets. And it wasn't just an economic problem for the city. Times Square isn't just a bunch of bright lights. Times Square is a $110 billion district. It accounts for 10% of the city's economic output, and it accounts for 10% of its jobs. And people tried to fix it for years, and nothing worked. So we decided to try something new. And thanks to the leadership of Mike Bloomberg, we closed Broadway to cars from 42nd to 47th Street, and we opened it to people. And we did it as a pilot. We, we would try it. If it worked, we would keep it. And if it didn't work, we would put it back to the way that it was before. And I love this photo. This is one of my favorite photos, because it's a reminder that all projects have hiccups, right? We were so proud of ourselves when we rolled out those orange barrels, Memorial Day. We've got the barrels in place, and we look out, and we suddenly see, oh my god, we've created two and a half acres of asphalt, but there's nothing there. Like, what were we thinking? So we ended up running to a hardware store in Brooklyn, and we brought hundreds and hundreds of beach chairs. And we brought those beach chairs to Times Square. And I love this because it really showed what was possible. And the headlines the next day weren't about how we closed Times Square to cars. It was about the beach chairs. Did you like the beach chairs? The color of the beach chairs, the size of the beach chairs. So all of you are involved in big projects. And I'm telling you, if you ever get into a problem, just think beach chairs. It works every time. And Times Square has been a different place ever since, going from this to this. And the beach chairs and the paint were just a start. And now it's gone through capital construction and become one of the top 10 retail locations on the planet, which is not really a surprise, because cars don't shop. People do. Traffic safety improved. Traffic moved better than it had before. And the number of people going through Times Square increased from 356,000 people a day to 450,000 people a day. And now there's a generation of New Yorkers and visitors who have not seen and don't remember Times Square any other way. But changing the street actually turned out to be the easy part. Changing the minds of New Yorkers that's really where the fireworks came in, because we were not just changing the facts on the ground. We were changing the way that people actually experienced the city. And let's just say that not everybody liked the changes that they were seeing. People said that we were ruining the streets of New York. People said that we couldn't have safer streets because we were not Amsterdam and we were not Copenhagen. Obviously can't argue with that. A whole lot of people weighed in. <laughs> I love that. Uh, but, and a lot of people really didn't have opinions about our street until we changed them. And it all boiled over when this Wall Street Journal editor went on TV and said that we were bike crazed and said that we were controlled by this all-powerful bike lobby and said that we were working hand in hand with a totalitarian mayor. And my hero, my hero, John Stewart, told it like it was old New Yorkers. They're just effing bikes, lady. Now, there isn't an app for updating hearts and minds, 
but there are strategies for overcoming skepticism. And one of the most important strategies that we had was using data to measure the impact of projects and documenting them. And we went beyond the traditional measures you use, like travel time savings, and looked at what the impact was on local businesses and what the local impact was uh, for everyone else on the street. And we found that bike lanes made our streets safer by over 50%. And, we, and local businesses saw their retail sales go up 50%. And we turned our analysis into headlines, started to change the narrative of our streets. We also looked at the who, the what, the why, the where, the when of traffic crashes to create a roadmap and rationale for implementing changes on our streets. And this data became front page news uh, in the New York Times. But beyond the nasty headlines, we actually found overwhelming support for these changes. By the end of the Bloomberg administration, we saw 73% of New Yorkers supported bike share. We saw 72% of New Yorkers supported the plaza and 64% of New Yorkers supported the bike lanes. If this had been an election, it would have been a landslide. But people are at the heart of this story. Administrations, mayors, leaders of projects come and go, but it's the people that carry the message forward. And we worked hard to change the way that we engaged with the public carrying ideas to them, actually listening to them on their turf. A lot of civic institutions don't listen when people are demanding change. And there needs to be a cultural awakening that makes the people's agenda the city's agenda. When you think about it, safety means so much more than it did 10 years ago. Since then, over 100 cities have listened to their people and have adopted Vision Zero, a commitment to eliminate traffic crashes and injuries that are predictable and preventable. And this engagement that we did, this new way of engaging, went beyond communities and included the agency itself. And many of the good ideas that we implemented came from within the New York City Department of Transportation. They were the ones that made everything possible. They were the real heroes of the story. Now, one of the big changes on the horizon, which I'm sure you've heard a lot about because you're at the Smart City Conference, is autonomous vehicles. Now, I've talked a lot about changing the hardware on our streets, and I want to talk a little bit about changing the software on our streets. Because redesign roads can only do so much if they're running on the same old program. And many people here are talking about a driverless future where optimized networks take over the responsibility of driving. And there is a lot to like in theory because human behavior is responsible for most traffic crashes from speeding, inattention, drunk driving. And seen this way, we should not be afraid of driverless cars. We should be afraid of the ones that we already have. And if we can connect our vehicles to the worldwide street, we can avoid many of the 1.3 million traffic crashes that we see on our streets around the world, minimize congestion, eliminate much parking. But it's interesting to see, if you Google autonomous vehicles, the only pictures you see are of people chilling in cars. It looks like if you get driverless cars, you get peopleless streets, except for the kid playing soccer by himself in the corner. Kind of sad, actually. <laughs> but if this sounds familiar, it's because we've seen this movie before, right? This was the technicolor fantasy of the 20th century. You know, people just sipping cappuccino in these autonomous vehicles, wearing these Logan's Run turtlenecks. And today, the fantasy is still autonomous vehicles and these blue turtlenecks. What is it with the blue turtlenecks? I really don't know. But this one has more of a kind of a, a Xanax and chill vibe to it all. 
But this driverless fantasy is just that, and we need to make sure that the autonomy serves our cities and not the other way around. That we don't accelerate sprawl with millions of people moving to autonomous vehicles, undermining transit and what makes our cities great. Because a driverless car is still a car and takes up a huge footprint on the street. Many of you know this classic image. It shows the space that 60 people in cars take up versus uh, in a bus or on bikes. And you can see a car takes up the same footprint, whether it's a regular car or an Uber or a driverless car or an electric car. They take up space, not just energy. And the point of driverless mobility isn't to have better cars. It's to have better cities. And we can't be so busy checking out the future of mobility that we turn our back on the design fundamentals that make our cities great. Cities, not just private companies, need to be innovating when it comes to their public transit networks and to take advantage of new technology. There's a great new roadmap put out by the National Association of City Transportation Officials, NACTO, called the Blueprint for Autonomous Urbanism that's got a lot of strategies to help cities uh, manage these changes. And I urge you to check it out at nacto.org. And it really make, it makes this real, the, the sort of change-based approaches for cities, so that cities are not left behind. And we've been here, we've seen what happens when that happens. You can see the consequences when cities are caught flat-footed by dockless scooters and bike shares. But the issue with micromobility, it isn't technology problems, it's not a mobility problem, it's a management problem. We can address this with planning, but cities need to lead in the design of their cities, not just react to what happens and what's put on their streets. The transportation revolution is not just about technology. It's about the transportation independence that technology makes possible. Transportation independence is the ability to get anywhere in a city quickly, safely, easily, no matter what neighborhood you're in, no matter your age, no matter your ability, and that's not usually how we look at transportation independence. For a lot of people, a car means freedom and social status. But if you have no choice but to drive for almost every trip you take, you haven't failed. Your city has failed you. Because freedom isn't the ability to get anywhere in a car. Freedom is the ability to get anywhere without one. Transportation independence is an investment in the future of the city. It's what makes a city successful and not merely smart. The good news is we know how to build the kind of streets that make this possible. The Global Street Design Guide is a new operating manual for streets around the world. I encourage you to check it out. It's been translated into five languages. It will be in Spanish early next year. A hundred cities have endorsed it. It's really become the new standard for streets. And what does it do that's so different? It flips the script on who our streets are for. It puts people first. And strategies that prioritize walking and biking and transit. Of course, every street is different but there are possibilities on every street. Turning a roundabout into a real place in Bogota, in Fortaleza, it doesn't have to take a lot of time or a lot of money. We can move fast, like here in Milan, over a weekend. Or here in Spain, the Rio Madrid project turned an eyesore into an asset that everyone can enjoy. And you can see what's possible right here in Barcelona when cars are put into their place. 
Barcelona changed the expectations and the model for our streets in the superblock districts. I think that's a model for the world. And it's not just about changing the physical structure of the city, it's about changing the soul of the city. Because it's not a question of engineering. It's a question of imagination. The road to a smarter city begins on the street, and it starts with steps that lead to transportation independence. And when you change the street, you change the world. Thank you all. Come this way, Jeanette. Let's talk some more. A microphone for you. Thank you. We're talking street design this afternoon. Let's put the house lights up a little bit more. This is not great street design because now I can't see through that table. Fantastic. We could just get rid of the table, street right? Street design. Or behind. No, that's great. All right, fantastic. Thank you. All right, street design. Where are the questions in the room? Put your hands up. Fantastic. OK, can you see the microphone because the lights aren't up there? OK, there's one right here. Fantastic. Who else put their hands up? I'm just going to organize you so you're there. All right, there's a microphone there. There's a microphone on that side. Who else had their hand up? Just, OK, fantastic. There's a microphone just in that next style. People won't mind if you walk around them and then stand at that microphone. Fantastic. All right, you get yourself organized. Microphone, microphone, microphone. You sound like you should be in transportation planning. <laughs> <laughs> when we were looking at New York, where was the impetus for we need to fix the streets? Who did that come from? Well, a lot of it came from the fact that our streets have basically been frozen in sight for 60 years. I mean, yeah. I'm a New Yorker. I grew up in New York. You can tell by the speed of my speech. I'm a New Yorker. Um, and my entire life in New York, the streets had never changed, right? Mm -hmm. And as a biker, the streets had never changed. As somebody that took the bus, the streets had never changed. And so rather than looking at our streets as like frozen in time in amber, you know, we needed to update them. Mike Bloomberg had a great plan. He said, look, we have to look at our assets differently. I mean, if, he's a businessman. And if you were in business and you didn't change your capital asset for 50 years, you think you'd still be in business? Mm -mm. No. So we brought that same kind of approach to our major capital asset, our streets. Good afternoon. Hello. Come a little bit closer. Can right you, up to the microphone. Oh, Fantastic. Oh, now I'm too close. OK. No, that's great. Hello. Hi, uh, my name is Katerina. I just want to thank you for your work as commissioner. I used to work for New York City Park, so oh, great. very so grateful my for sister. all of your efforts. Um, my question for you is about scooters. I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, where scooters have truly taken over every square inch of sidewalk. And my two questions for you are, A, is this a real transportation trend that is adding value and B, what is the place of the scooter in the street or where do they belong if they belong anywhere? I think that's a great question. I mean, there's no question that there was a tsunami of scooters that sort of landed in cities around the world, right? And, and people were caught a little unprepared. And I think that anything that gets people out of cars and provides additional options is interesting. And we should, we should definitely support that. But I think the jury is still out in terms of um, how they fit into the transportation network. And it's important that we integrate them in. So uh, I showed a slide about the sort of shared mobility guidelines that have been put out by NACTO, which is a way that cities have come together to say, OK, if we're going to have these new uh, vehicles on our streets, these micro mobility vehicles, they, we need to have a different rule for them on the road. And so here are some suggestions about how we permit them, cap them, how they can really be an asset. So that's part one, is actually making sure that they have a thoughtful place in our transportation system. I think the second piece is, is managing them well. And so understanding the data from these vehicles and making sure that they go into places where they're needing, needed. So in your home state of Michigan, 
In Detroit, for example, under a shared streets platform, which any city can use, it's free, the city has actually used that as a way to track where those scooters are, and they require the company to actually provide those scooters in underserved neighborhoods. So these scooters are not just in a central business district, they're actually providing first mile, last mile connection in neighborhoods that wouldn't otherwise have them. So I think that they can play a really supportive role, but I think we have to be careful and make sure that they do what they, we want them to do and not just become obstacles and stumbling blocks um, on our roadways and sidewalks. Thank you. Good afternoon, sir. Hello. Hi. Uh, thank you for the great presentation. I really learned a lot. Uh, my question is, for me, a street is a uh, living home. Like, we live in a home in during many of our time, but many of the time we also travel, we sit outside in a street, and we spend a lot of our time in the streets, right? And when you say designing a street, there are a lot of stakeholders involved in uh, living. Like someone is maintaining the street, someone is making the street, uh, like you have the law enforcement agencies, you have transportation agency, but everything is for the people. End of the day, the people is the final end customer. So how do you involve all these uh, stakeholders in uh, designing uh, the street? Yeah. A very profound question. Thank you for that. Just a small question. How do you solve for that? Um, one of the ways that we worked um, initially was to get all of the city agencies on the same page for street design. So we had actually 11 city agencies that touched the street in some way. And we brought them all together uh, and over a two-year period worked out what we needed to do to incorporate a single design guide for all of our agencies to use. I mean, it was messy. Everybody hated those meetings. It took two years to do. Uh, but it's one of the things that I'm most proud of was this uh, actual street design guide that actually put everybody on the same page within city government. Now, that's one piece of the pie. The other piece is how do we involve communities and non-traditional communities and get everybody's uh, input into these new projects and programs. And we actually changed the way we did public involvement. It used to be that if we were going to propose a project to a community, we would sit on a stage like this, and you'd be in the audience over there, and we would present our project, and people would react, and usually it was the loudest voice in the room that would react with the microphone that that person would hold for a really long time. And a lot of the other people that had important comments couldn't be heard, or they were shy, or they you know, didn't have access. And so we changed the way we did community engagement, and we went out to communities. And we changed how we were asking the questions so that we could really get detailed, fine-grained uh, input from them. And so we tried to just get out as much as possible into communities in times where they were able to be there, not just like 7 p.m. on a Sunday when people are busy with their families, but making it possible for people to come at all times of the day, also engage in online, but to try to get as many people involved in the process uh, because people feel very strongly about their streets. They're 8.5 million New Yorkers, and I used to feel like they were 8.5 million traffic engineers because everybody has a strong view about their streets, and I think that's great, but it's very important that we involve them in the human infrastructure of change. Hello. Hello, uh, my name is Florencia, I'm from Argentina, and I wanted to thank you for the presentation and also for sharing all this knowledge and strategies around the world. Um, so my question is the following. Uh, more than 10 years have gone by, um, have passed since uh, 2007 uh, disrupted strategies. So what do you think are the next uh, moves, the next uh, disruptive strategy that, are going, that is going to come in terms of smart cities, in terms of urban planning, in terms of governance? And what do you think are the main barriers for that disruption? Well, I, I think, uh, as I talked about this afternoon, I think a smart city is a city that gives people choices for getting around. And I think cities of the future are prioritizing transit and building out their transit network. I think smart cities are making it possible for people to walk around, making it very easy to get around town. 
uh, for cities that make it easier to bike uh, to, and to take the bus. I think that's the secret sauce of cities. Of course, we can use data to much better analyze the gaps in our networks. Right? I mean, right now, you can do with your smartphone, you can pick up more information and, and use that to analyze your networks you know, then, you know, it used to take you years and years to do, you know, the traditional way. So I think we can harness technology to help us more efficiently and effectively lay out our transportation networks. And there are great new um, services coming up, micro-mobility services, and I think it's important for cities to get in front of the curve and decide what's the city we want to see. That's the fundamental question that needs to be answered, not what are the technology toys that we can put on the city. What's the future of the city that we really want to see? Jeanette, I am going to make an executive decision right now because I am supposed to wrap up this segment and then I'm going to talk for two minutes while they set up the chairs. I would rather hear you talk for two minutes while they set up the chairs. So we're going to do some good old fashioned New York transportation. So we're going to walk to that podium, okay, New York style, and then they are going to set up the chairs behind us because I don't want to spend two minutes of them hearing me. I want them to spend two minutes hearing you. All right, we have relocated. This is the cue for the set to be a reset up for the next plenary session. Good afternoon, sir. Um, my name is Pablo Borrello. I live here in Barcelona. And I want to, well, uh, just to tell you something, uh, about two years ago, we had a terrorist attack here in Barcelona, and about 16 people died in La Ramblas. This was an emergency, and the city immediately moved everything just to put barriers, just to put the police on the street, just to protect certain pu public areas, just to avoid anything like that to happen again. There are even the city is saying that we have hundreds of people injured and dozens of people dying every year on the street in this city. And at the same time, because of pollution, there's something like 4,000 people dying early every year. What is necessary for city councils, for municipalities to actually move faster and believe that those things are actually emergencies. That is not just something they can wait on, they can just think that is going to solve this problem over the next 10 years or so. That's another beautiful question. Thank you for that. I do think that it's, you know, a, a big part of the point that you raise, which is the emergency, is people don't really see traffic fatalities and crashes as emergencies. They see them as accidents. There are things that just sort of happen. You know, that happens in our streets. We've got cars. They just happen to crash into people rather than talk, talking about them as traffic violence. And part of that is understanding where the problem is. So we work very hard in New York City to do, and we've done for other cities in Mexico City and Atlanta, looked at where the problem is and got that information out to show people where the crashes were happening and then work very hard on the street designs because these crashes can be stopped, right? It's a matter of street design. It's a matter of speeding. You know, speeding cars are what kill people mostly. So we know how to control for that. So a big part is making a vision, saying we're not going to stand for this, showing what the problem is, and then moving quickly to show that it can be different. But it takes political courage, and it takes people like you raising this and making the case. And that's part of how this change happens. If you look for Jeanette Sadiq Khan, her TEDx talk is online. And a lot of the things that you've been talking about today are on there and your ideas are on there as well. Jeanette, you came through the, the round hole so beautifully. Would you mind exiting that way? And I know the audience have loved your company. I've enjoyed your company too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Jeanette Sadiq Khan, thank you very much, everybody.